Last week, we started a series called Playlist, and we said that our lives create this playlist, or have this playlist that creates an atmosphere, this melody, this sound that's produced by what we say, what we do, and, and it, it's either pointing people to God or it's pointing people away from God. And the challenge for all of us is to say, you know, what is my life doing? What is my life saying with, what I, what I, what, with the words I use, with the actions I have? What is my life saying to people when they see me and come in contact with me? What is the environment, the atmosphere around my life? And is it pointing people to God? If it's not, then we need to reevaluate that as believers and disciples of Jesus. I want to shift a little bit this week and talk about what that looks like within the church, the sound of the church, what that looks like. There's, uh, when we talk about the church, there's values that, that make the church who we are and how we operate and how we, we conduct ourselves, these values. And, and values, uh, they, they really show and represent the convictions of somebody. And not only that, it also shows what they believe, their ethics and, and how they live their life and all that kind of stuff. And, and so... Um, there's four core values that I think we can look at for the church in general. Not just life church, but, but how the church should be in general. Four things I want to talk about today is love, um, worshiping in truth, uh, fellowship, and transformation. And I believe those four things are kind of really, uh, every church should be uh, deeply entrenched with these core values. Um, otherwise, I would question whether or not they are a biblical church. Um, and Acts 2 uh, is one of my favorite places to go with that. But I want to start with love. Let's, let's go there first. Um, can we do something together this morning, a participation thing? We all know John 3.16, right? Can we say it? For God so loved the world. Fantastic. So great, great scripture. The gospel, the heart of the gospel is centered on love. We talked about it a little bit last week. God loved the world so much that he gave his only son to go to the cross to die for us. And, and it showed this incredible love that God has for, for people and for us, for us and all of our mess and our sin and, and our disobedience. God still sent Jesus to take care of that mess and to offer us a life that's eternal and everlasting. And so... Everything that we do, we said last week, the foundation, the springboard for us as a church is really is love, right? That, that everything has to center on that. The center of the gospel, the heart of the gospel is love, and God loved us, so he sent Jesus. And because of that love, uh, 1 John 4 tells us that that love should compel us to love other people. Because we've loved, been loved so well by God, that should compel us to love other people. Um, it's so important if... if we, we could preach on love almost every week because it's so critical for the health of the church that if we're not loving people, we're missing the mark as a church. And so because we've been loved so well, we're, we should be compelled to love others. And I want you to turn to Luke chapter 6. We're going to read just one verse out of Luke chapter 6, but I want you to highlight it if you can in your Bible. Underline it. Highlight it on your digital copy on your Bible app. But Luke chapter 6 verse 27. Luke 6, 27, I'm going to read it real quick. It says, but to you who are willing to listen. Man, that's a, a really important statement to start this thing off. For you who are willing to listen, I say, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. It's so easy to love people who are lovable. It's so easy to do that. It's really difficult to let this thing become part of who we are when it's someone that, that hates us and that it's hurting us and saying bad things about us and coming against our families or our mamas or whoever it is. And, and, and it's real hard to say, oh, yeah, I'm going to love my enemy. But, but we're called to do that. He said, if, if you're willing to listen, I want you to hear this. Love your enemies. Love those who hate you. Do good to those who hate you. I look at, um, I don't want a rabbit trail, so if I do too much, Chris, throw something at me, okay? Um. Only if I rabbit trail too long. Uh, I look at the political climate of our, of our society and, and the church, and guys, I, I feel like a broken record, but I'm so tired of church people getting caught up in stupid arguments about politics. It's so stupid. There's no other word for it. Who cares what your political party is? If you said yes to Jesus, you're a disciple of Jesus, that comes before everything else. 
And what we've done is we've said, well, if you don't believe like me in politics, then I can't be your friend. I'm going to take you off my social media. I'm going to disown you. I'm going to, I'm going to tear up your reputation in the community all because of what you believe about a wall or illegal immigration or the president or this or that. It doesn't matter. There's so many hot topics I can pull out right now that, that's causing division among the church. And it's stupid. It's senseless. We don't need that. The gospel is centered on love. Even the people who disagree with you, you got to love them. The people who are on the other aisle politically than you, you got to love them. It doesn't make any sense to say anything other than that. I've got people that, are, that I look to that have been a, a follower of Christ for a long time, but they're lifting up these politicians like they're the savior of our world. They're the answer to the problem in America. I would say that's wrong 150%. The reason why we have issues in America is because we have issues in the church. We have issues in the church because people are pretending to be followers of Jesus, but they're not actually living out and being obedient followers of Jesus. Families are breaking apart. Marriages are breaking apart. And we say, why is all this happening in our country? we got to elect these officials. We, we have to legislate evil and stupidity. How in the world do you do that? You want to combat evil. You better be following Jesus and be arming yourself with the armor of God. You better be out in the community showing people that your play, the place of your life is pointing them to a Savior who is the answer. It's not a politician. It's not a piece of legislation. It is Jesus Christ. The playlist of our church should not sound like the Democratic or the Republican Party platform. It should sound like the Word of God echoing out from our music and our preaching and our actions and our words for our fellow believers and our people in the community. That's what our playlist should sound like. It should be based on love, not on politics. Who cares? Guess what? Politicians come and go. Legislation changes every year. But what doesn't change is the Word of God. The person that doesn't go away is Jesus Christ. And we can't get caught up in that. I've been guilty of it. I mean, sometimes it's hard for me to keep my fingers from going on to something and doing something stupid. I commented on something last night, just seeing stupidity. I'm like, why did I even comment on it? Because I know these people are electing to be stupid, and, and it doesn't make sense for me to get involved in this. But they're doing it anyway, and, and we're under the name of God. If it's not on this platform about this issue, then it's evil. We should banish it and kick them out of this country and this and that. Don't do that. Don't do that. Church, we're called to be, be known by our love. Even for the people we disagree with or that disagree with us. So if you're willing to listen, love your enemies and do good to those who hate you. Our culture does not define love that way. It's ambiguous. It's based on good feelings. If you do good to me, I'll do good back to you. I'll love you. But if you hurt me, well, you know what? I, I may not like you. I, I may even hate you. That's the way our culture dictates what love really is. And even that word thrown around so much, it's lost its true meaning. We've become desensitized to what love really is. Church, I'm telling you, love has a name. His name is Jesus. That's what we look to. You want to know what love looks like? God sent it to the cross. He sent love to the cross for us, for you and I. And the playlist of our church should sound like heaven. It should, it should mirror the word of God in everything we say and everything we do. Romans 12, 10 says, Love each other with genuine affection and take delight in honoring each other. Jesus said, You'll be known as my true disciples by your love for one another. If you're hating people, don't tell me you're following Jesus because I'm probably going to call you out on it and then you're going to be mad at me and then you're going to hate me. But don't go pretending and have this big, elaborate thing like, oh, I love God, but oh, I can't stand this person because of what they do or what they've done or what they believe or the party they affiliate with. Who cares? Who cares? At the end of the day, what we're talking about is people's souls. We're talking about eternal consequences for how we act and how we treat people. And if we're not loving people the way Jesus has called us to love them, we're just pretending to be followers of Jesus, but we're not really followers of Jesus. The cool thing about rabbis and disciples is that you can take the rabbi away and the disciples look just like the rabbi. Can that be said of you and I? Can that be said of you and I about who we profess to follow and learn from? 
Y'all, if y'all wanted something light and fluffy, y'all need to go down the road, because uh, if you haven't caught on yet, today's not that day, all right? <laughs> Romans 12, 10, love each other with genuine affection and take delight in honoring each other. Take delight in honoring each other. There's so much, uh, such a lack of honor in the church, it's unreal. It's unreal. Listen, our playlist, when people walk in, we have to stop feeding the the, uh, the, the mindset from the outside looking in that we're hypocrites. We've done that so well. It's time we reverse that, all right? It's time we reverse that. We get mad when people say the church is hypocrites, but they're not wrong. They're not wrong. The majority of the time, we are hypocrites. We say one thing, we do another. We don't have to be perfect people. We have to be people who are on a journey of looking like Jesus and allowing God to transform us every single day. And then one day, one day we get to be face to face with him and it's gonna be a beautiful experience like nothing you've ever seen before. So, so in, in the word of God, love is defined for us in 1 Corinthians 13. I've used it a lot in weddings. I'm gonna read it to you this morning and I want you to bear with me. You can follow along in your own translation. I'm gonna read it from the Passion Translation this morning. We don't have it on the screens for you. But 1 Corinthians 13 really shows us the love that God has for his people, and it shows us the love we should have for each other. But I'm going to just start, and I want you guys to bear with me um, as, we, as, we, as I read this. Uh, verse 1, it says, If I were to speak with eloquence in earth's many languages and in the heavenly tongues of angels, yet I didn't express myself with love, my words would be reduced to the hollow sound of nothing more than a clanging cymbal from Jeff's drums. And if I were to have the gift of prophecy with a profound understanding of God's hidden secrets, and if I possessed unending supernatural knowledge, and if I had the greatest gift of faith that can move mountains, but I have never learned to love, then I am nothing. And if I were to be so generous as to give away everything I own to feed the poor and to offer my body to be burned as a martyr without the pure motive of love, I would gain nothing of value. Love is large and incredibly patient. Love is gentle and consistently kind to all. It refuses to be jealous when blessing comes to someone else. Love does not brag about one's achievements nor inflate its own importance. Love does not traffic in shame and disrespect nor selfishly seek its own honor. Love is not easily irritated or quick to take offense. I think I should read that one one more time. Love is not easily irritated or quick to take offense. Love joyfully celebrates honesty and finds no delight in what is wrong. When I look at online and what the church is doing with politics, there are people who are happy that other people may be suffering or that they're on the wrong side of a debate. That's crazy. And it doesn't reflect Jesus. It says that love does not delight in what is wrong. Verse 7, love is a safe place of shelter for it never stops believing the best for others. Love never takes failure as defeat, for it never gives up. Love never gives up. Verse 8, love never stops loving. That's so, I love the way that says that. Love never stops loving. There's not a point in your life where you just stop. Love never stops loving. It extends beyond the gift of prophecy, which eventually fades away. It's more enduring than tongues, which will one day fall silent. Love remains long after words of knowledge are forgotten. Our present knowledge and our prophecies are but partial. But when love's perfection arrives, the partial will fade away. When I was a child, I spoke about childish matters, for I saw things like a child and reasoned like a child. But the day came when I matured, and I set aside my childish ways. For now we see but a faint reflection of riddles and mysteries as though reflected in a mirror, but one day we will see face to face. My understanding is incomplete now, but one day I will understand everything, just as everything about me has been fully understood. And he closes out with this. Until then, there are three things that remain, faith, hope, and love. Yet love surpasses them all. So above all else, let love be the beautiful prize for which you run. That's good stuff. You wanna know what love really looks like. It's patient, it's kind, it's not easily irritated. It's not jealous, it doesn't boast. It doesn't get happy when someone else's, their life is jacked up. You wanna know what it looks like to love somebody? Look at Corinthians 13. It's not a wedding scripture, it's a disciple scripture. 
People who are following Jesus, that's how we are to be defined. We'll be known by our love for one another, by that love, a love that never stops loving. But here's the cool thing. Our ability to love like this, it only happens with our connection with Jesus. We can't do that without Jesus. There's no way we can accomplish that kind of love without Jesus. And because of that connection, that kind of love that God has for us flows out of us so we can have it for other people. He does the heavy lifting for us. That's the good news. It, it, it's our connection to Jesus, to the truth. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the what? Yeah, welcome to Life Church. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. We seek after truth, not for knowledge, for knowledge's sake, but, but because it's knowledge that transforms lives. And when we get the knowledge of, of who Jesus is from his word and, and what God's all about, his spirit gives us revelation every time we open the book and it changes our lives again. And every day we get to the word of God, we're seeing something new, we're experiencing something new, we're, we're able to walk away with refreshment and, and, and being filled with just encouragement and power and purpose. And we can go out. Listen, we're doing Soul 30 for a reason. I know it's hard to be consistent with spiritual habits. It's hard to be consistent in prayer. Let's not try to say it's not. It's hard to be consistent in Bible reading. Who here does it every day without ever missing a, a single thing? Don't raise your hand. I don't want to embarrass nobody. It's hard. God just wants you to be obedient. He knows there's going to be times where you miss a, a, a conversation or you miss a reading. He understands that. He just wants you to be obedient and continue that process of coming after him and, and being intimate with him. And You miss a day, it's okay, don't beat yourself up over it. Pick it back up. The cool thing I love about talking with God and, and being connected to Jesus is that I don't have to have some grand prayer that comes out of my mouth that's rehearsed. There are some great prayers that have been spoken and written over the centuries that are great to, to use in a prayer time, to start off your prayer time, to get your prayer pump going. But nothing beats, in my mind, the rawness of just being open with God and all of your mess because there's nothing that you can say that's going to scare God. As a matter of fact, he wants you to be completely real. He already knows you're looking at pornography. You ain't got to hide it from him. Just say, Lord, I've been looking at naked women. I need help. He wants that. Lord, I've been, I've been thinking very, very bad things about my boss. He already knows that. Just be open with him. And guess what? He's going to meet you right where you are. And if you position yourself, he's going to continue to transform those parts of your life that you're saying, Lord, I can't do this on my own. I'm, I'm feeling defeated. And he's right there working, saying, just be real with me. Just be honest with me. I already know. I'm not going anywhere. Oftentimes, we, we put our life experiences on God. You know, we had a dad that left, so God, he's not going to stay with me if I mess up. Or a spouse that left. If, if I do something wrong, God's going to leave me too. Or he's going to punish me because I, I, I said the wrong thing in, in, in prayer at church this morning. Listen, that's not who God is. He's a good father. He wants to be connected with you in a very intimate way. So that when you go out, not only are you loving people, not only are you proclaiming the gospel message and, and casting out demons and healing the sick and, and all those different things, but at the end of the day, you get to go to sleep at night resting in, in a peaceful relationship with the God of the universe that says, I got you. I got you. I love you. Even though you, you're electing to be stupid sometimes, I still love you. And I'm going to still transform you and grow you if you let me. And it's so great. We have a world full of lies and fake news. And what the world needs to see is a church who are standing up and saying, no, we're, we're people of truth. We're, we're connected to truth. We speak truth because we know that the word of God says the truth will set us free. Hallelujah. The truth will set us free. It's not a catchphrase. It's not something you put on a mug. It's the word of God it says that the truth will set us free. So what is truth? Jesus said, I am truth. So if we are connected to Jesus, we have freedom. We have freedom. We're not bound up by chains anymore from yesterday's mistakes or, or, or caught up in the same traps the enemy keeps trying to fool us with and get us in, ensnared with. We have freedom in Christ Jesus. No weapon 
formed against us will hurt us, right? We serve a God who wants us to be prosperous, not just talking about money, but just being prosperous in our soul and our spirit. We serve a God who says, look, if you trust me, I can see the, 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 the finish line. You can't see it yet, but you trust me, I'm going to get you there. I'm going to love you the whole way. I got you. And guess what? If we're not modeling that lifestyle of truthfulness, there's no way we can convince anyone that Jesus is good, that he's worth it, that he's worth putting behind all the stuff from our past or, or the things of the world to follow if we're not modeling truthfulness, if we're not showing people what it looks like to be like Jesus and what the real Jesus offers. If we don't model truthfulness, we're going to miss opportunities for other people to be connected to him and to the family of God. We can't afford to do that, church. People are dying every day. We can't afford to play games in church any longer. We're starting off 2019 the right way. We're pursuing God. We're pursuing God's word. We're saying, look, I've got to have you. I've got to have God in every area of my life. And guess what? You may not see that thing you've been praying for happen. That's okay. You may not like that. That's okay. Because all you need, and I know it's so easy to say when you're not in your situation or facing your obstacle, but I'm telling you, all you need is God. All you need is God. The rest of the stuff we struggle with and strive for, all this stuff's going to fade away one day. But God is always going to be there. And if nothing else, we have him, we have that connection, we grow, we become transformed, and we connect to the body of Christ. This is a really good-looking body. You guys are incredible. I look around, there's so much talent in here. And I declare all the time that we're a healthy body. We ain't got broken toes and messed up noses. We're whole and complete. Everyone is, is going to be doing what they should be doing, what they're called to do, what they were created to do. That we're a healthy body and everybody's working together. We're not working against each other. If my two feet decide to go in different directions, I'm in bad shape. But as a, as a body, that illustration of the church, that we all have different parts that work together. We're healthy. We're whole. 1 Peter 2, 17 says this. Respect everyone and love the family of believers. Fear God and respect the king. I'm going to read it one more time because I think it's really good. Respect everyone and love the family of believers. Fear God and respect the king. Even if the king isn't in your political party. Y'all hear me? But it says love the family of believers. We are family. That's one of our, our 12 stones, our, our core values as, for life church is that we are family. Sometimes family gets messy because people are messy. Sometimes we have to work through things. But I, I, I say this, and I know this, and I'm seeing this. We have created an environment where people can get connected right where they are and grow in, in their relationship with Jesus. And one of the things that I've strived really hard for as a leader is saying, if there's conflict in the family, we're not going to brush it under the rug. We're not going to just say, no, we're, we're going to hit it face on. We're going we're to confront that issue, and we're going to take care of it but I can only do my part. Or, or the, you know, there's two parts in confrontation. So if both people aren't willing to reconcile, it won't happen. But, but as a church, that's our, that's our goal. That's our core value. That's what we strive for is we're going to be a people who reconcile because reconciliation is based on love as well. And that flows from our relationship with Jesus. You might get mad at me, and that's okay. I'm pretty sure I'm make, make you mad at some point. Not on purpose, I, I wouldn't hope, but, but one of the things we know is that in family, in, in biological family, sometimes, well, I guess you can run away and never talk to someone again, which that's not good either. If you're doing that, y'all pray about reconciliation for that's not good. But a lot of times your brothers or sisters, your mom or dad, whatever it is, they, they, they get on you, they rub you the wrong way, and you just like, ugh. But deep down, you still love them. There's this connection there. That goes beyond the, the circumstance. Church, that's who we are as well. We may not be blood related, but we're related by the blood of Jesus. And so because of that, we're not going to allow the enemy to cause division in this house. We're not going to allow ourselves to be disconnected because we get easily offended because that's not what love is, right? 
If I love you, I won't be easily offended. I may be hurt. I may be frustrated, but I'm not going to be offended. I'm going to seek out reconciliation because that's exactly what God does for us. And so we are family. We grow as that. We're, we're a family of believers. In Acts chapter 2, we see this incredible picture of what the church family looks like. They worship together. They pray together. They study together. They ate dinner together. They, they pray together. They ate dinner together. I mean, they, they ate dinner together. Y'all, <laughs> my phone's not broke wherever it's at. Y'all invite me over for dinner, all right? <laughs> but as they did that, they helped each other when, they were, when there was a need. If someone was in trouble, they had a need, they, they helped them out. And they grew. They grew so big. It changed the world. Because they were a family. They understood love. They understood pursuing truth, which was Jesus, and not compromising on that. And they grew because they were a family. When we're born again, we become brothers and sisters in Christ. I'm your brother. What's up? Mm hmm. One of the things we want to do here at Life Church, hands down, and I think we've, we've done it and we're maintaining it. And some of you are the product of that. But that we want to create a loving environment, a safe environment, where people can come as a family, worship, learn, share life, and ultimately grow together in Jesus. That's what we're trying to do here. Not so we can hold you in these walls, but so we can release you out into the world to be disciples of Jesus, who are going out and finding people who are lost and broken in a lost and broken world and saying, listen, there is hope. His name is Jesus. If your mindset about church is you come and you participate and you go home, you've missed it. Listen, church is not a service. It's a people. You are the church. You are the church. And so if our song, our playlist, our melody coming out of this place, this house, is going to reflect Jesus, then we have to have this connection that starts with love, that pursues truth, and that is connected at a, at a deep level as a family. And as we have that connection, we know that Jesus changes everything, and, and our relationship with him is core. And what happens is it doesn't just give us a place to go to when we die. That's great. I'm so thankful that I have a place to go to when I, when I leave this earth that I could just spend forever with Jesus. But it also unlocks change that happens in our present life. All of this changes. All of it changes. Paul says, renew your mind, right? The Spirit of God renews our mind to give us a different viewpoint of the world. I think that's probably the most frustrating thing for me when I look at the church and politics. It's because we know we should be renewing our mind, which changes our worldview and changes how we see people, but yet we still take on this old mindset and look at politics differently than any other issue in our life. Because for some reason we can do that. We can just stick it in its own bucket in life, and that's it. And so we can say and act and do whatever we want to do with that particular thing in our life. But if our minds are being renewed, then we look at that differently because guess what? Whether you agree with the wall or not, with illegal immigration or not, those are still people. They're still people. And guess what? The terrorists in Iraq and, and the Middle East, they're still people. If I'm not mistaken... I believe John 3.16 says that he came for the whole world, even the bad people, people that want to kill and steal and destroy and, and act like the devil. He came for those people too. You may not like hearing that, but that's the truth. And so what does our life song, what does our playlist say about those people? I remember being a kid, I read that scripture one time where it said, Love your enemies and do good for those who hate you. And I thought, and I prayed about this to God. I said, God, should I be praying for the devil? He's my enemy. Should I be praying for him? I'm not getting to that this morning. <laughs> but I really reflect on that as a young kid. How far does it go? How far do I take this command to love my enemies? How far? Corinthians 13 says, love never stops loving. Now, don't go home and say, the pastor told you to go pray for the devil. I mean, we ain't getting all that. Lord, if you're watching, y'all disregard that. Cut that out, the replay, whatever. But I want you to know that with transformation that happens, everything changes in how we view the world and people. And we can't forget that we are in the people business. You were once lost and now you're found. 
and found people, go and find people. Rescued people, go and rescue people. If you're not doing that, I don't want to get in trouble this morning, Chris. We're known as disciples of Jesus by our love. Jesus also said to go out in the world and make disciples. He said go out and preach the gospel and push back the kingdom of darkness. Heal the sick, cast out demons, all these different things. Listen, if you're not doing that, I'm not sure you can qualify as a true follower of Jesus. And that's hard to say. It's probably even harder to hear. But we can't just take one section of what Jesus said and feel good about it and say, I'm a follower of Jesus because I said yes to Jesus. That's great. But the demons believe too. If we're not being obedient disciples of Jesus, we're missing it. And church, we're not going to do this year like anything of last year in, in the sense that we're not going to compromise on the word of God. And if it's hard for you to hear this morning, I'm so sorry about that. You can write Jesus a letter and talk to him about it. But the word is pretty clear. He said, if you love me, you're, you're my true disciple. If you love other people, you're my true disciple. Go and make disciples. Go and teach. Go and baptize. Cast out demons. Preach the gospel. Love your enemies. Pray for those who hate you and persecute you. That's what discipling, or, uh, the life of a disciple looks like. Those things. So when I ask you what your playlist sounds like in your life, is it pointing people to Jesus or not? Is it pointing people to a false reality of who God is? Or is it pointing them to who God really is based on his word? 2 Corinthians 3 says this, So all of us who have had the veil removed can see and reflect the glory of the Lord. And the Lord, who is the Spirit, makes us more and more like him so we are changed into his glorious image. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for transforming our lives so that we look like Jesus. Because we can't even do the things I've just said to do without the Holy Spirit. And guess what? It's a free gift that God gives us. It's like, here, take it. Take my spirit and go change the world. Go change the world. Here's what's so cool. I'm going to close with this. At Life Church, we're a group of people who are changed people. We're changed people. And our desire, our heart, especially from our leadership team, our heart's desire is to see others' lives changed. And when we see changed lives, we see changed communities. So if you're looking around Orange County, if you've ever said anything negative about Orange County, I want you to, to think about this from this perspective. If you ever said there's nothing here, that, that this place is terrible, whatever it is you want to say. What you're really saying is that the people here are terrible. You're not talking about buildings. You're talking about people. Whether it be politicians who haven't got businesses in for our kids to do something or whatever it is or our families tearing up stores or whatnot. You're talking about people. So if you want to see a changed community, then, and if you've been changed, then I'm going to challenge you right now. When you leave here, open your eyes for opportunities to help others change their life. Because when we have changed lives, we have changed communities. The problem in America is not with the politicians, it's with the church. We gotta get ourselves together and operate the way Jesus called us to operate. Otherwise, you're just keeping a seat warm and you're pretending. And one day, it, it, at, at the end of the age, when we're face to face, there will be people who are saying, but I did this for you, God. I prayed. I served in church. He said, I don't know who you are. There was no love. There was no connection to Jesus other than serving. There was no real connection. There's a lot of people who know about Jesus but don't really know Jesus. And for people who know Jesus, our job is to go out and show them that our atmosphere of our lives are helping them understand that, whoa, whoa, this is bigger than just a, an amen, the altar. This is a lifestyle change. So I want to challenge you this year. Again, sorry for no fluff this morning. Uh, you can get your money back at the end of service if you need to. 
I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm going to challenge you this year. This is a year stretching for me. It's going to be a year stretching of me stretching you. It's time to stop with the, the games and the, the smoke and mirrors. It's time we step up, we rise up as powerful followers of Jesus, and we go and change our community by changing people's lives. And guess what? It can happen one conversation at a time. Don't get overwhelmed by it. It's just one conversation at a time. Meet people where they are and just love them where they are. Love them where they are. You, your job isn't to clean them up anyway. That's for God to do. Your job is just to love them and show them Jesus and speak the word of God over them.